morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for March's edition of Health Bites with Region 3. We are pleased to welcome this month's speaker, Diane Connery. Diane Connery, director at Pottsboro Library, has been committed to rural public libraries since 2010. She earned a Master of Library Science from Texas Women's University and a Master of Gerontology from the University of North Texas. Ms. Connery is actively invested in efforts to improve broadband access and digital inclusion in rural communities. She is passionate about inspiring others and advocating for the work of rural libraries with an emphasis on addressing the technology needs of the community. The Pottsboro Library was named one of the top three best small libraries in America in 2017. Ms. Connery was honored as an innovator in Library Journal's Movers and Shakers class of 2021. She was selected as the 2022 Texas Small Community Librarian of the Year. In today's Health Bites, our speaker will give a presentation on the role of rural libraries in promoting digital health literacy. Thank you for being our guest speaker this morning, and I will turn everything over to you. Good morning. Okay, let's pull up these slides. Um, I am Diane and I'm in Pottsboro, Texas. So you can see on the map on the right, we're uh, kind of halfway between Oklahoma City and Dallas. And um, the in-town population is about 2,300. Our service population as public libraries are assigned about 3,800. And just to give you um, some context, um, our, our budget, all in taxpayer funded budget, this year is around 36,000. So that's salary, that's utilities, that's cleaner, that's everything. Um, and anything that we do outside of what that budget allows is from donations and grant writing. So I always say your mileage may vary. Um, I'm going to share like a smattering of things we do related to health and hope you can take something away from it and you can scale it to, to where you work. So um, I'd always lived in large cities and moved to Pottsboro in 2010. And it's a rural area on a beautiful lake about an hour and a half north of Dallas. Um, but it is like driving back in time in in many ways and not necessarily in a quaint way. Um, we a lot of people buy lake homes here from Dallas, come up on the weekends. They eventually retire here. But then what has happened historically as people need more services, health related services as they age, they move back to what we call the Metroplex, Dallas, Fort Worth, because those services just do not exist in our rural community. And so one of the um, observations I made early on was uh, around the um, connectivity, the infrastructure for people to access the Internet just does not exist in a lot of our areas. And that's because for providers, it didn't make economic sense for them to, you know, invest in internet infrastructure out here. And so when I came here, I, I just observed at the library and thought, how are the kids here ever going to be on a level playing field with their peers from larger cities? Um, if they don't know how to use computers and, you know, they don't have internet at home. So digital inclusion became our focus early on. And a lot of people, when you hear library, um, it, it, they go to the stereotypical idea of what, you know, oh, I, in fourth grade, I went to a library and checked out Charlotte's Web or something. But that's really not our focus here in Pottsboro. We're about essential services. And a lot of that is because um, the town has such a small tax base to, you know, when it's budget time to, to come up and say, okay, the city has a small bucket of money that's divided among police and fire and streets. 
the um, the only way the library can can um, challenge for that money is that we are providing essential services. So we did a lot of fun things, esports, et cetera. And then COVID was a, an awakening for us. And um, so you see on the left there, um, the Need a Doctor Connect online at the Pottsboro Library. Uh-oh, let me forward to my next slide here. So, um, you know, it, every small town is different. And I think uh, we, we're all experts at providing the services that, that work in our town. So one of the things that became clear early on is whatever problem a person has, if they are not connected, that problem is made worse. And so that goes for employment, education, um, health information and equity. And so one of the things early on in COVID that we did was um, when the school shut down, talk to our, our local school and had them create the, the list of addresses of homes where people did not have the internet. And so you see all those blue markers on the map. Those are both students and teachers who did not have internet in their home. And actually, the situation was worse than that. Early on in the pandemic, people said, oh, you know, I've got my cell phone I can use as a hotspot, not recognizing, you know, or thinking about data caps or when you have three kids at home trying to you know, access that for streaming services, it just didn't work. So that, that the blue markers are just the tip of the iceberg there. So one of the things we did early on is the green marker bot, um, bottom towards the right is where the library is. So we made sure we boosted our internet signal here at the library so that people in our area could come and, and, park at the library to use Wi-Fi. I will say that we stayed open throughout the pandemic just because internet access and device access and the digital skills um, are, are such an issue in our area. And we knew that people needed that access. So as a library, we reduced the number of people coming in at a time, um, but we did uh, stay open throughout the time. And then the other markers, the yellow, orange, purple, maroon, um, we set up permanent hotspots in those areas closer to where people um, lived. Because in our area, transportation is really a, a barrier to a lot of services. There is no public transportation and there's no ride sharing. And, so, and a surprising number of people do not have cars. And so we knew we needed to get the internet closer to where people lived, understanding that ultimately the answer is for people to have it in their homes. Um, you know, in Texas, sitting outside in the summer in, you know, 100 degree heat trying to work is not ideal. So I became interested in digital health inclusion, and that's just everyone should have the fair and just opportunity to engage and benefit from digital health tools. And some of that is health portals, some of it is apps, some of it is internet and being able to log on and check your explanation of benefits, or if a doctor is sending you messages. Um, and so digital inclusion, it overlaps tremendously in health outcomes. So we started getting calls um, from people in the community, a veteran who said he had always called in his um, prescription refills. But if you remember back to the beginning of COVID, a lot of the services, their phone lines were overwhelmed. They were swamped. Um, I had one man come in. He showed me his phone and he had tried that morning um, to 
uh, call in 143 times um, and could get, not get through. And he call, called us at the library and said he had never touched a computer in his life, but he couldn't get through on the phone. Could we help him? So we brought him in and within an hour on the computer, we had logged in and um, signed up for his benefits that, that he needed. He was a um, worker at a hotel a dishwasher and it had shut down. And so he needed to access the internet to get those. And so um, being a small library, mostly we were one big room. And um, so for privacy purposes, I was setting people up in my office, which was the one private space and um, on, on my laptop. But then along came a National Library of Medicine grant, um, a COVID grant, and we submitted a proposal to create a virtual health room at our library. Um, they funded it generously with $20,000 to, and it's the room I'm in right now, which had been a weeding room where people donated, you know, old books that we did not want, but people being nice thought they were sharing valuable things. So this room was just stacked with donated books um, that hadn't been looked at in years. And so we were able to clear out this room and with the funding from National Library of Medicine, create this space. Um, we pulled up the, the dirty old carpet that had been in here. Um, the room had no HVAC system. So it, the benefit of that was there was not cross ventilation with the rest of the library. So we were able to um, purchase an HVAC system called a split that is just for this room only by computers um, and sound absorbing panels. You can see behind me the blue. So I could understand a lot of that, but what I needed help with was the other end of the, the telehealth appointment. If we're doing this, you know, I know what we need on our end and librarians have a long history of um, tech help and digital literacy skills, helping people with that. And we're information specialists, so we understand how to guide people to authoritative resources. But I couldn't conceptualize how do we prevent double booking the room? You know, if people in their homes call and set up appointments, and then three different people came in and said, hey, I've got an appointment Tuesday at 10 o'clock. How would we prevent that? And the beauty of this was National Library of Medicine in our region is housed at University of Texas Health Science Center. And I think over a water cooler, <laughs> there were some connections made like, hey, why don't you talk to them? And being a rural library, I fly by the seat of my pants. One of the wonderful reasons we're able to innovate is there is very little bureaucracy. So if we get an idea in the morning, we can implement it that afternoon, but turns out that is not how hospitals operate. And so over a period of months, we had these planning um, phone calls with what are the logistics of making appointments? What's the disinfection protocol? What does marketing look like? Um, and so um, we came up with this system that two days a week, people can access UNT Health Science Center providers um, by calling directly the Health Science Center, making those appointments, and they take Medicare, Medicaid, private pay, um, most insurance plans. All that work is done directly with the Health Science Center. And then at the library, I get an email the day before saying, okay, Diane, you've got appointments tomorrow at 10 and one. I don't know what they're being seen for. I don't know their names. Um, so their privacy is protected in that way. But librarians know privacy is a big deal with us in, in any case. Um, and so um, Health Science Center, Safer Care Texas, 
created this virtual toolkit to help people because we did make some mistakes along the way or or learning, we'll say learning that if we were doing things differently the next time, um, we learned some, some best practices. And so um, when I was talking to other public libraries in our area early on, the big pushback I was getting was we don't want to be encouraging people to come to the library when they're sick, which actually happens anyway, because all of us in public libraries know that sometimes we'll see kids here in the middle of the day with a parent and the parent says, oh yeah, they were sent home sick from school, but we decided to come here and pick up some movies and books, that kind of thing. And HIPAA concerns were the other um, concerns, which um, I think we'll talk about that later, but um, that has been addressed um, to, to my satisfaction. Again, your mileage may vary, but um, the, in Texas, um, the Texas State Library brought in an attorney. Attorneys will typically not <laughs> state anything as an absolute, but they said um, what we are doing is we are a conduit to the appointment. We are not collecting any of the health information. We're not saving it anywhere. We're basically just providing um, the, the internet connection and helping somebody with the computer. I have been on, there's a national working group um, for telehealth and libraries, and they did have an attorney on there who said, well, it's a little unclear where libraries fall in the HIPAA things, but his recommendation was that we should at least have people um, sign a consent form. So we reached out to our regional telehealth resource center and got a consent form, um, which I'll I'll talk about, I think, um, next. So this is what the room looks like. Um, lighting is important for these visits. And so you see the three lighting panels there. Under the white bench to the left is a HEPA filter that runs. We space the appointments 15 minutes between so that um, the room can be cleared out. A lot of this, you know, once COVID, once we had a better understanding of COVID, um, wasn't seen as necessary, but that's how it was established in the beginning. On the shelves there, you see there's an orange bottle of disinfection solution. So we have, you know, where to, what surfaces to clean, how many seconds it needs to stay on. And Safer Care actually created that. Uh, disinfectant for us and gave us probably 18 gallons. So we have tons of it. Um, so, and we do have a scale, a thermometer, a blood pressure cuff, and a pulse oximeter. Um, I eventually took my uh, uh, CHW training and consumer health information specialization, but we were having people take their monitor, their blood pressure by themselves rather than us doing it. Since then, through a grant through the Texas State Library, we have hired a consumer health worker who also is in nursing school and he's now facilitating these appointments and he can take people's blood pressure. Um, but some, some setups don't have those at all, some do, so that, that's something that varies um, according to your comfort level. And that's just a close-up of uh, a webcam. One of the things some of the healthcare providers um, let us know was that people um, had been sitting in their cars trying to do telemedicine appointments. And sometimes the doctor wanted uh, maybe to see their gait, to see them walking. So it was um, important to have a space where people could get up and move around. And the other feedback we got early on going back to digital health literacy was um, healthcare providers were spending a lot of the appointment time troubleshooting, like, okay, here's the link to sign in for the appointment, 
but people didn't know how to click on that link or um, that sort of thing. So, so much of the appointment time was, was spent um, that in ways that weren't efficient um, for the, the uh, patient or the healthcare provider. So um, one of the things that we learned after the initial round of marketing was um, <laughs> we were asking people to come here, combining two different things that they might not be comfortable with. Um, and a lot of people don't want to see a healthcare provider. So our initial marketing materials were, a, it was a close up of a laptop with a mask laying across it. And um, some very kind 78 year old woman gave us the feedback that what mattered to her was this human connection, this understanding that there was a friendly, non-judgmental patient person who could help them with this process. So focusing on the technology part of it was not the way to go. They wanted to see this friendly, smiling face. And there on the left is one of the providers that they actually see. So that's a much more um, welcoming, less intimidating image when you're trying to promote telemedicine. It's, it is about that human connection. It's not about the technology. So two days a week was the Health Science Center, and then we've implemented one day a week um, with a, a behavioral health group that can uh, facilitate that. Now we're working with some local nonprofits, uh, Texoma Community Center, to access that service. And I will say one of the unexpected findings we had was some people do have the digital skills and the connectivity at home, but they don't have a private space. And so they wanted to be able to come to the library to have some privacy because they might not want everybody in their homes overhearing what an appointment was about. Um, so I mentioned I um, took through the Medical Library Association, Association my consumer health information specialization. I think for public libraries where some of the staff is not as comfortable with um, answering some of the questions, that's a great place to get started because one of the benefits after the appointment you know, let's say the person says, okay, the doctor is saying I need to um, have a better diet to lower my blood pressure. We can guide them um, to authoritative resources. Usually for us, we use Medline Plus rather than people um, just Googling random places. And National Library of Medicine has all sorts of resources, and I've taken lots of the, the, the classes and become more interested in um, health literacy and um, kind of assessing the health literacy, the, the um, promotional materials and educational materials we are putting out there. So um, the Harvard School of Public Health I think it was last year or year before, they put out a call for organizations to send them our, our materials we had created. And that could be anywhere in the process of, you know, people logging on to fill out the, the pre-appointment paperwork. It could be our promotional materials, um, anything along those lines. And so I sent them what we had done and just this second paragraph I mentioned from the Regional Telehealth Resource Center, um, we had adopted their consent form and they had used the term, the likelihood of this transmission being intercepted by persons other than those at the consulting site is extremely small, which uh, now, you know, I look at that, it's like gobbledygook. So they had um, recommended the chance of this information being seen by people who did not work on my healthcare team is very low, much easier to understand. And I will put in a plug at this point too. Um, I've become involved 
with the International Health Literacy Association, which has a number of different interest groups. And um, one of the interest groups is Librarians Advancing Health Literacy. And I would encourage anybody who's interested to get involved. We have monthly online meetings um, for librarians who are interested in, in health literacy. And I think they'll put that um, link in the chat. So um, it, uh, the broader picture um, in libraries now and other community-based organizations nationwide, um, digital navigators, and they talk about this in terms of it being a three-legged stool, although now they've decided it actually has more than three legs, but digital navigators are um, people who can develop ongoing relationships, back to that human connection, with people providing tech help is an easier term than digital navigators. But one of the pieces, one of the legs of that stool is helping people find affordable, robust internet for their homes. There are various programs that do that. Um, ACP, uh, Affordable Connectivity Program, is a federal program um, that uh, internet providers can adopt, uh, opt into and people can get um, $30 a month off internet bills, tribal areas, I believe it's, it's $75 off a month. So that's one leg of the stool. The other leg of the school the stool is um, device adoption. Many times, right now there's so much federal money flowing and a lot of people are getting these free devices um, Sometimes they're devices that are not easy to use. They may be refurbs. They may be not working well. That's not doing a favor to anyone, giving them an old device that doesn't work well. Um, and so through a, a Google.org um, grant and National Digital Inclusion Alliance, um, we've been awarded, and this is still incredible to me, a $351,000 grant to hire a digital navigator for three years. And part of that grant is $20,000 a year to give out um, devices in our community and develop the skills that people need to use them. So that uh, digital resilience is not just about learning one platform, learning how to do specific things, because we all know this, the updates, they happen so often, and then your screen looks different. So it's about learning how to be comfortable kind of poking around um, and um, getting more comfortable that you're not going to break the internet. So in a small town without a newspaper, on the left there, you see door hangers. Our digital navigators literally went door to door, hanging um, things on people's doorknobs. We sent these out to everyone on the right, the postcard, everybody in our zip code. Of course, we use social media and email blasts. Um, we're doing outreach visits to VFW, Senior Center, uh, American Legion, any group that will have us, um, we're going out and presenting to them and promoting our digital navigator services. Oh, and TV commercials, too, have been our most effective um, thing. So if you're not familiar with North Star Digital Literacy, it is a nonprofit, a national nonprofit that is free a digital training and assessments um, free to individuals. And they now have uh, an assessment for accessing telehealth appointments. And I haven't checked just recently, but I know they were working on a curriculum training for that as well. Um, so that, uh, and obviously different healthcare providers, their platforms may look different, but this was about kind of generalizing, like here's where the mute button is if you want to unmute. And this is, you know, where you need to have your camera focused, that sort of thing. So that can be a great um, no cost resource for, for everyone. 
um, that Health Science Center, UNT Health Science Center in Safer Care, Texas, um, brought a simulation lab to our library um, through a local grant. Uh, we were able to hire 15 teenagers to be intergenerational digital health navigators. And um, I loved this. So we took these teens through three weeks of our typical health navigator training. And that's like, if you don't have an email address, here's how you set one up. Here's how you, <coughs> excuse me, attach a file. Here's how you take a picture, you know, those sorts of things, how to scan a document. People may need to, to scan blood pressure logs and send them to their healthcare providers. So the teens did those three weeks. And then with that simulation lab, we had different, um, stations set up for them to work through in a four-hour training. On the left there, you see some goggles, and the goggles actually had different. Uh, one was glaucoma, macular degeneration, diabetic eye, I forget what the other was. But so these teens got to experience like, okay, you're trying to help somebody set up an email uh, address now see what they're seeing and you know like if you've got a neck brace on okay what if you can't bend your neck easily to look at the screen what is that experience like the top right we had them put on kind of thin gardening gloves and then we had colored beads that they were to sort into their pill containers um, to simulate like okay you're setting up your pills for the week. And then we had them like, okay, button your shirt. What is that like? Just to mimic that um, loss of sensation or fine motor skills. And then bottom right, uh, online software for simulating various degrees of hearing loss. And like, okay, this is, if you have moderate hearing loss and someone is speaking to you in a meeting, this is what you're hearing. And um, I loved it because it was intergenerational. I'm hoping these teens will eventually become the entrepreneurs in our area who will develop businesses so that people can age in place and not have to move back to the Metroplex. But it gave them tremendous um, insight and built empathy. And we did a talk back board for the feedback, just gave everybody post-it notes. And one of the things um, at the end of the day, when we said, you know, what did you learn today? Or what's one thing you'll take away from today? And this is just so rural is why I loved it. Um, one of the teens said he had a newfound appreciation for his grandpa who lives on a farm outside of town because his grandpa has um, vision and hearing issues, but he can haul hay like nobody's business. And so um, some of the teens said, like, I would be exhausted before I ever left in the house in the morning because just buttoning up my shirt is a thing. So I found this a really valuable um, program to provide. So we're also licensed by um, AARP has a subdivision um, through Older Adult Technology Services, Senior Planet. It is free for people to call for technology help. And they also have free classes um, and things like how the Internet of Things changes healthcare. So it helps people. They can take free online classes and um, learn a, a variety of different things that apply to their, their health. I offered a class here, how to turn your house into a smart home, because my mother lives many states away. And for instance, I have a virtual um, assistant set up like a Google Echo in her house. If she doesn't check in with it by 10 o'clock every morning, it emails me or sends me a notification that she hasn't checked in. 
um, just so I can know to to check on her because she usually, you know, gets up and ask it to turn on music or set a timer or, you know, what's on her calendar for the day, that sort of thing. But there are all sorts of um, technology things that can help somebody age in place now, like a ring doorbell. If they're expecting medicines to be delivered that have to be signed for um, and they're slower to get up and get to the door, then this can help them say, hey, the delivery person, I'm on my way, the door, give me a minute. Or, you know, help them see who's at the door. Also, if they have mobility issues, just things like um, smart plugs or smart light bulbs so that they're not having to reach over to turn lights on or off. Or they can turn it on um, if they're getting up to go to the bathroom during the night. They can turn a light on with their voice. So there's a lot of... Um, things that are coming and future things that just blow my mind. I am so excited about um, the technology and how it's going to impact us um, going forward. And I'm talking autonomous vehicles and drones that drop AED. These things are not just future. They're happening now and can really impact people's independence. Um, As I mentioned, we've hired a community health worker. Almost no ideas are original of my own, um, but luckily uh, librarians are very generous people who share ideas and we build on one another. And so in South Carolina, they were way ahead of the curve on hiring community health workers who help facilitate um, telemedicine appointments and just provide all kinds of resources to people who are coming in to the libraries. Um, I really respect the work they're doing. Disaster response. Um, Unfortunately, several years ago, we had a, a major ice storm in Texas that shut down our power grid. Um, for up to seven days, a little more than that in some places, but that also shut down our water. And in a small town, um, the city employees, city staff, not large enough to take care of all the needs. They were out like literally fixing, digging, shoveling, you know, broken water pipes. So because people didn't have water, the library became the disaster response hub for our community. We were able to talk to local ranchers who had wells who would transport their water into town. And then we were able to distribute the water, not just for drinking, but for flushing toilets. You can imagine people who lived in apartment buildings and what problems Um, would result from not having toilet being able to flush for for seven days. So we did put up porta potties in the back of the library in the parking lot. Um, One lovely um, supportive local restaurant said if we would bring them well water for cooking, um, they would cook before their food went bad in um, their restaurant so we were able to deliver hot meals to people in the community and it's about um libraries being connectors that we know so many people in the community and who has resources and so we became the go-to um person for helping people who were housebound um in the community really proud of the work our staff did. As a result of that, um, afterwards, um, it, it not in a way of blame, but how can we go forward and do better um, going forward? We talked to the Office of Emergency Management in our community, and they provided a nine-week and in-depth Um, community emergency response team training. And um, so I can do things like tie a tourniquet, um, you know, how to respond if there's a tornado, how I clear a building, because what became very clear to us in our rural area is it may take first responders quite some time to get to 
to us that we've got to be able to help ourselves. And um, I love that about a rural community. So many people like checking on their neighbors, all kind of thing, and wanted to get involved so that we will be better prepared um, going forward with how we face these situations. And I did do um, uh, recently uh, a webinar for Gigabit Libraries Network, along with New Jersey State Library, who had responded to hurricanes. Um, and we know that um, climate change is happening and impacting a lot of things. So what is the library's role in that? And so that webinar was uh, libraries as climate adaptation leaders and um, the New Jersey State Library had all kinds of wonderful resources to think about um, and, and being intentional of how we can prepare to help our communities going forward. And also um, Web Junction did a really excellent webinar, public libraries and public health just to um, be able to talk through some of these things, how we can work together. I think that was a huge aha moment for me um, through COVID in a rural area, but I think it applies everywhere. But there are all these um, outside national and regional um, groups and organizations who want to serve these communities, but they don't have the access directly to the people the way the library does. We see them come through our doors every day. So we really have an intimate understanding of what the real issues are. And so we can be helpful to these outside organizations in meeting their mission by working together with them. And I've heard in the past, sometimes, um, you know, when you're collaborating with a large organization, um, the smaller organization can be collaborated on instead of collaborated with. And luckily that's not been the experience I have had at all. Um, it really just is about how do we get to, to help individual community members. And to that end, one of the partnerships we formed is American Heart Association. They, I reached out to them and because I had seen it, it happening in Memphis or another town, um, the Heart Association had provided to a library blood pressure kits to check out to the community. And so they, at no cost to us, provided blood pressure kits. We check out for three weeks. There's a little, gosh, probably four minute video that we have people watch on proper techniques to um, monitor their blood pressure. It comes with a, a three week log that they can um, measure their, their blood pressure. And then we also have the community health worker who can help demonstrate to them as well. But if you don't have that, there is a video that they can watch. And the American Heart Association, through that initial um, connection, then asked if there was anything else they could help us do. So they helped set us up as a meal site for summer for anybody 18 and under and provided nutritious meals, but luckily they are actually things that kids want to eat. I was concerned it was going to be like mystery meat or jello with peas and carrots in it. It's not. Um, it's stuff the kids, you know, yogurt and applesauce, the kids were really excited about eating and packaged in fun ways. So we do that through the summer. And now um, in our region, the American Heart Association is hosting a rural health summit. Um, it'll be in May and it's for six different states bringing together stakeholders, um, you know, local government and healthcare providers and libraries and just any sort of people who want to talk about community resilience, community health. Um, it's bringing us all together. So I would encourage you to reach out in our situation. I found 
There are a lot of organizations that don't realize what libraries do now. They still have that nostalgic view of how libraries serve their communities. And so um, we are there to help them. And in turn, strategically, sometimes I say it's all about me, um, they have some funding that, that can help us make these services possible um, that would not happen otherwise. It would not, what we have done would not have happened without funding through the National Library of Medicine and Safer Care Texas and American Heart Association and Office of Emergency Management. All these groups and, you know, federal funding that's flowing now. And I've had USDA reach out to me and say, how can we help you do your job better? So I think part of what I need to do, there's my reminder, um, part of what I need to do is amplify our um, voice of what libraries are doing in, in the public health arena. So that was my reminder to um, allow some time for questions. I know that was a, a mishmash, a mash million, <laughs> um, a list of, of things we're involved with. Um, but I'd love to hear if you have any questions and I'll stop sharing. Thank you uh, so much for the wonderful presentation. So we'd like to open it up to, to any questions and I know they're, they're coming through the chat now. Um, Diana, I wanna let you know, you had a lot of great feedback. People loved all of your outreach and your programs and, and your, your, the mishmash of everything you've done. <laughs> okay. Now, I, you mentioned a few times the people when they think of the, the stereotypical library. So where they went as a child to get a book. Obviously, Pottsboro is very different from what they're imagining. Do you ever get pushback from, from your community or other, um, other figures that you're doing things outside of the library sphere? Yes, I do. Um, not so much anymore. Um, but in the beginning, um, the library was going to close because it had no taxpayer funding. It was all donation, all volunteers. Volunteers were aging out. Um, Kids were not welcome at the library. It was dusty old books, literally had not been checked out in 15 years. Yet people in the community felt the, the importance, philosophical importance of having a library in the community. And so I thought, well, they're going to close anyway. What if I came in and did everything differently? Because, um, you know, it's going to close anyway. So I did from some of those volunteers, I got hate mail. Um, how dare I? And I went to an Association of Rural and Small Libraries conference. And one of the speakers, I wish I could credit her, said, if you are not making people mad, you are not doing enough. And um, so I have held on to that tightly. So a, a lot of, um, I think what is important about the work we do is understanding what it's time to give up. For us, our summer reading was not impactful. It was not successful. The craft things we were doing were sweet, but I couldn't see how that really impacted the community. And so just strategically, if I'm going to go up to city council and say, hey, give me some of that money instead of the police department, I can't be talking to them about cutting out pumpkins. I've got to be speaking things that are meaningful. And one of my favorite stories was, I think it was three years ago, maybe four um, budget time, the police asked to replace a 10 year old police car and city said, no, um, hold on to it one more year. We want to give the library another budget increase. So starting from 2010, when we got no budget, um, they started like a couple years later after they saw our innovation um, and we started writing grants to fund these things. They gave us $4,000. Our budget has increased every year since then. Okay, that is, <laughs> that is amazing um, to hear. So we had a couple of questions. Let me see how many we can get to in the next couple of minutes. So you had mentioned that the UNT, the Safer Care, came in with their simulation lab to train your, your teen employees. Do you know what like, software or technology they were using? I training? do. Yes. I, I don't know it off the top of my head, but I have, they shared a whole 
curriculum for the simulation lab with me, and I'll be happy to email it to you afterwards um, to, to share out because they just, um, it was actually something they had done with their medical students. So we adapted um, for, for our um, community. And some of it can be even like we were talking about, if you don't have the goggles, you could put Vaseline on eyeglasses to simulate some of that or put tapes over, you know, st tape strips of tape on eyeglasses, that kind of thing. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Um, and then we had another question. So you obviously, you, you worked with the UNT Health Science Center and their, their healthcare staff for the telehealth room. Are you also working with the, the library staff? at HSC? Uh, no, I have not been I'm with the National Library of Medicine staff there, but not the, the HSC library staff. So, someone says you need to write a book <laughs> um, in, in all of your free time. I'm sure. Uh, and let's say, so, and so you also mentioned, yes, like all of the, obviously your funding is 36 or your official funding is $36,000. Yes. With all of this, it's taking lots of grant funding. Where yes. where are you where are you finding the grants and how do you find time to write these grants? Um so I, I'm on lots of different listservs where they publish like American Public Health Association, the Rural Health Information Hub, USDA, any kind of listserv, and some of them you can specify for you know, grant information. But I would say so much of our success has been cross-sector coalitions and not project-driven. Um, not just like, hey, there's an opportunity for a grant. Would you partner with me? It is about building these ongoing relationships so that we know what each other is doing and then when something comes up, it's, you know, we're, we understand each other and can um, move forward much more quickly. Yeah, so, okay, so a few people have compromised. Instead of writing a book, maybe you could just do a journal article. <laughs> they, they, they want they want to hear more from you. Um, I will also, you know, uh, that NNLM is working on a telehealth um, online course. And Diana is going to be one of our, 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 our experts in that. So she's done quite a bit. So look out for that um, in the coming in the coming months. Okay, let me find, I've lost my chat. And let me find that again. Let's see, we've got one more moment. Actually, yeah. So I think, yeah, we're just about time. I want to make, be careful with everyone's time. Jen, if people want more information for me, are they, are you providing my contact information or do they reach out to you? How does if, that work? If you, if you would like us to provide your contact information, we, we yes. would be more than happy to do that. Okay. We will, we will um, send that out when we send out the, the webinar recording. Yes, please so. do. I always like talking about libraries, as you might be able to tell. <laughs> <laughs> and you're, you're so enthusiastic about it. That's why we, we love having you um, do these things. Um, so I just want to thank um, everyone for joining us today. And a special thanks to Diane uh, for sharing your expertise with us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all at next month's Health Bites with Region 3. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.